Welcome back. So today we're talking about physics informed machine learning, specifically the fourth uh, kind of stage of machine learning, how do you craft a loss function? So specifically um, in this pipeline of physics informed machine learning in this uh, kind of five step procedure of how we build a machine learning model, today we're gonna talk about how you can build a loss function that uh, allows you to embed partial knowledge of your physics into the process, okay? This is one of the areas that's kind of most commonly used and it's one of the easiest ways of baking physics into a machine learning model which should improve its generalization capabilities, uh, its learning rates and efficiency, sample efficiency, lots of benefits, and it's a relatively simple, straightforward thing you can do to your machine learning model to make it more physical. Good. Um, okay, so the first kind of example that I think is most natural to people when you think of uh, adding a loss function to make something more physical is this notion of a physics-informed in physics neural network, or a PIN, P-I-N-N, uh, developed by uh, Rizzi, Perdicaris, and Carniadakis in... Um, this should not, I don't think, be 2023. They introduced this method uh, a few years ago, um, and I'll have links in the, the description for all of these. But the basic idea is if I'm trying to build a machine learning model to predict some physical quantity, like a fluid velocity field, um, a fluid velocity field might have um, a component in the x direction, we call that u, a component in the v direction, we call that sorry, the y direction, we call that V, and the component in the Z direction, we call that W. Maybe it also has a pressure field. And these fluid flow fields vary in space, X, Y, and Z, and time. So the kind of naive approach to, to modeling this would just be to build a big, deep feed forward network where the inputs are spatial locations and the output is the fluid flow field at those space and time locations. And you could do this if you had enough data, but it would be very expensive and a very big model. What PINs, physics informed neural networks do, that's really, really clever and interesting, so sorry, before I get into what PINs do, the traditional naive version of this uh, neural network would just have a simple loss function, which is that the output prediction by the model should match an actual true velocity field on a big set of training data. That's like a normal loss function we would use. What PINs does, what physics informed neural networks does that's very, very clever, is they add a second loss function. So because of the automatic differentiability uh, of these modern machine learning uh, environments, PyTorch, JAX, uh, TensorFlow, so on, you can take these quantities, U, V, W, P, and you can compute their partial derivatives with respect to space and time. So you can actually build, you know, essentially for free, all of these partial derivatives that went into the partial differential equation that you think your system should be satisfying. So for, you know, working with a fluid flow field, these should be satisfying the Navier-Stokes equations, which is a partial differential equation in these purple variables. So PINs adds a loss function. It adds an extra loss function here, which essentially says, how much is the governing physical equation, the partial differential equation that governs the physics, how accurate is it, how much is it violated um, you know, on the data or on some virtual test points based on these purple quantities? So let me say that one more time. So you build a feed forward network that you think can predict these flow field quantities, but in addition to the naive loss that's just the kind of you know, data fit loss, you can compute partial derivatives of those outputs with respect to the inputs, and you can add a loss term, which is literally like the norm of the partial differential equation. So if that partial differential equation is not satisfied, it's not you know equal to zero or whatever, then this error is gonna be large, and that means that you're not satisfying the physics well. So this is a really clever loss that allows you to train models with way less data, and they tend to be much more accurately representing the physics. So one of my favorite um, conceptual ideas, because it's so simple, um, and it's you know super widely adopted, tons and tons of people use this, it's probably one of the most popular uh, physics and form machine learning algorithms out there, because all you have to do is add this loss function, uh, and your models become more physical. 
Now the downside, um, just to be balanced, is the downside is that by adding this physics as a term in the loss function is that you're never really going to exactly satisfy that this loss is zero. So an actual physical system, an actual fluid flow, this purple loss should be exactly zero. Let's say mass conservation and momentum conservation are being you know, captured here. We know that those should be exactly conserved. This is only going to promote that they're conserved. It's going to suggest that that, that term goes to zero, but you're always going to have a balance between these loss functions. So you're going to get something that's not perfectly physical. But it's more physical than if you did not add it. If you only did the naive training, you'll get a worse model oftentimes than if you add this extra physics-informed uh, loss. So really, really cool idea. Again, we're going to have a whole video you know, series on this. Um, there's a really cool example of this in a paper um, by uh, Wong and Rose Yu uh, from a couple of years ago where we know, for example, that again, fluid flows, incompressible fluid flows satisfy this incompressibility partial differential equation. U is a whole spatial velocity field, and we know that the divergence of U equals zero for incompressible flows. So essentially what you can do is, you know, uh, I guess this is the, the ground truth fluid simulation. What you can do is you can take your, your naive kind of standard machine learning loss, your model prediction minus the data squared, and you can add a loss term, which is I want my estimated U to actually be divergence free because that's what the physics says has to be true. So this is very similar to that physics-informed neural network where you add a loss term that promotes uh, that physics being satisfied. And I'm pretty sure that uh, the TFNet is the actual um, one proposed by, by Wong and Yu that includes this custom loss function. And it does a better job of capturing the fine uh, scale structure and it's more conservative. It conserves mass better than if you didn't include that loss function. So a really simple thing you can do to immediately kind of add that, uh, that notion that you're promoting physics that is known. If you know some conservation law or some partial differential equation, you can add it as a loss function and start promoting um, that physicality. Now, it may or may not be harder to train. It might make your optimization stiffer. It might make it find weird minima. Like, it's not like this is just a silver bullet, um, but it's a really clever idea that I like a lot. Okay? Good. Um, other examples, so we talked about this Lagrangian neural network. There's, there's a whole class of Lagrangian neural networks and Hamiltonian neural networks, really clever architectures. And I talked about these in the context of architectures in the last lecture, where if you know that your system conserves energy, like it's a mechanical system, like your double pendulum, um, we know that it does that by either having some Lagrangian structure, you know, it satisfies the Euler-Lagrange equations, or some Hamiltonian structure, it satisfies Hamilton. Hamilton's equations. And I said that that was a choice of architecture. But in reality, when you actually get under the hood of how you train this Lagrangian neural network, a lot of the special sauce is actually in the loss function. So you basically have this network that's trying to learn a Lagrangian. But the loss function is that if I compute the partial derivatives of that Lagrangian and I build my Euler-Lagrange equations, this is essentially in the loss function, is that it actually satisfies the Euler-Lagrange equations. So this is a point I'm going to make over and over again. Architectures and loss functions really go hand in hand. So this is an architecture. You are learning a Lagrangian you know, with these inputs. That's an architecture. But the thing that allows you to train this architecture and have it make sense and be Lagrangian is that you have this loss function that that architecture actually satisfies the Euler-Lagrange equations, that the L you learn satisfies this equation. So that really is actually a loss function uh, as well. And I'm going to have a video on Hamiltonian networks and Lagrangian networks and talk about you know, how you actually uh, train this and set it up in JAX. And it's, it's really cool, really cool paper. Um, they always make their code open uh, and available so you can download this and try it yourself. Good. Um, now, there are other ways we can add physics into our machine learning models through choices of loss functions and, and also choices of architectures. So 
I, you know, have, I, I always talk about this because this is where, where my group's research goes and my collaborators, we think a lot about interpretable and generalizable physics models uh, with machine learning. And so essentially, I'm gonna give some examples of this in a minute. We can promote models that are more low dimensional with the two norm, uh, and we'll show you how this goes into the loss function in a minute. And we can promote models that are simpler, have less terms describing them, or are more sparse using the one norm. Okay, and both of those concepts of low dimensionality and sparsity are mathematical ways that we make our machine learning models more interpretable and more generalizable. And I would argue that those are key features that make these models more physical. If you have a model that is as simple as possible, let, let me, uh, you know, not jump the gun here. So what do I mean by interpretable and generalizable? I mean things like Newton's second law, F equals MA, which is true for an apple falling on Earth, and it's also true when we land humans on the moon. That's super generalizable. And it's very interpretable because it's simple. It only has a few terms in it. So that is this principle of parsimony. Um, I like this Einstein quote. Um, you can replace everything with your machine learning model should be made as simple as possible to describe the data and no simpler. This has been the gold standard of what is physics uh, for 2,000 years, from Aristotle to Einstein, models that are interpretable and generalizable are typically the models that are as simple as possible to describe the data and no simpler. Which, going back to these norms, that's what we mean here. If I have a machine learning model, I want it to be as low dimensional as possible. I want it to be as sparse as possible. I want there to be as few uh, degrees of freedom, as few describing parameters as I can possibly get away with to describe my system. And I'm gonna do that with the two norm and the one norm in a strategic way, okay? So again, we're talking about loss functions. These are the norms you put on your loss functions when you train your model. Um, this is just a cartoon of what these different norms look like. Um, the L2 norm measures distance in a typical Euclidean way. It's just like the distance between two points as the crow flies. The L1 norm is a little bit of a different um, measure of distance. Sometimes we call it the, the Manhattan norm or the taxicab norm because it's not the straightest distance path. It's kind of the, you know, if you had to take surface streets in a grid, that's how you would measure the distance between two points. I have a whole set of lectures on sparsity and L1 and L2. I'll point you to in the description uh, and give a link. But essentially, these norms quantify different notions of parsimony or simplicity in physical systems. Um, so going back to our pendulum example, again, um, if I had a video of a physical system, I might choose an autoencoder neural network to choke down this high dimensional, you know, megapixel image space down to a couple of variables that are most descriptive. And I would use an L2 norm to do that. I would basically be measuring the two norm of the error across this network. And I'm trying to get low dimensionality in this latent space. So that's, that's a norm. And I might also wanna learn the dynamics in that latent space. I wanna might learn how to those coordinates evolve in time, in which case I might use something like the sparse identification of nonlinear dynamics to find the fewest terms in a differential equation that add up to equal theta double dot. So that would be quantified by the L1 norm down here. So you know I might use an L2 norm up here to quantify low dimensionality and a one norm down here to quantify sparsity. And I might have a loss function that kind of balances those two things. I want low dimensional and sparse. Um, there's a really cool paper by Kathleen Champion where that's exactly what she does. I talked about this already in the architectures lecture, um, kind of the third stage of machine learning, because it is a choice of architecture um, where you have data and you're trying to learn a good low dimensional coordinate system like theta and theta dot, and you're trying to learn a differential equation that describes how those variables evolve in time. But I want to point out here, now this, we are looking at the loss function. There was a very specific custom loss function that Kathleen had to cook up to allow this model to be trained, to quantify what we mean by low dimensional and sparse. 
And this was not an easy loss function to, to come up with. This took like months of trial and error figuring out how to actually craft the loss function to quantify what we meant by physical in this, in this context. So here, this is the reconstruction loss. That's literally the error of the autoencoder. Um, it's a two-norm reconstruction loss. All the way on the end here, we have our, our Cindy L1 loss. That means we want this differential equation to have as few terms as possible. And then there are these custom losses in the middle. And again, there's a whole video uh, where Kathleen describes this. I'll put a link to it. But there are custom losses in the middle that essentially join these different parts, this kind of encoder, decoder part, and the fact that we want our dynamics uh, to be consistent throughout this model. So long story short, architectural choices that promote physical models, low dimensional and sparse models, typically have custom loss functions that involve the two norm and the one norm to accomplish that task. Um, I like talking about Cindy because it's a really intuitive example of how just the choice of the norm makes a model more or less physical. Um, and it's a method that's pretty near and dear to our hearts. You know, we developed this um, here. Uh, in Seattle, myself, Josh Proctor, and Nathan Kutz, where if you have data from a physical system, you want to learn some physics, some differential equation. You want to learn the equations, but you just have data. You can essentially build this library regression procedure. It's a machine learning model. It's a, you're building a model from data where you're trying to fit the time derivatives of your state in terms of the fewest uh, terms that could describe your differential equation. Now, these could be polynomials or sines and cosines, whatever, but I want the fewest columns of theta to add up to equal x dot. That's what I mean by sparse. And those models will tend to be more interpretable and generalizable through this principle of parsimony. Now, there are a ton of loss functions I can use to train this model. One loss function would just be least squares. I could just do a least squares regression to find um, the weightings C that would add up these columns to equal x dot, y dot, and z dot. But I'm going to get a physics model, x dot, that has 81 terms in the differential equation. Y dot's going to have 81 terms. Z dot's going to have 81 terms. You never open up a physics book and see you know, a model that has 81 terms in the differential equation. That just somehow doesn't... Uh, isn't consistent with the principle of parsimony that comes up over and over and over again in physics. And so there's other norms we can look at. Um, I can add other regularizing terms. I can add a two norm to this coefficient vector so that they are small. I can add a one norm to this coefficient vector so that it's sparse. I could add both. That's called the elastic net. And we do something like that in the Cindy procedure. We do something, you know, sometimes we do lasso, sometimes we do elastic net, sometimes we add our own custom loss function or optimization algorithm. But we want sparse models where most of the coefficients in the model are zero. That's more physical in some scenarios. And so, you know, this is kind of the loss function we end up looking at. We have an L2 loss. I should put a little 2 here. We have an L2 loss, which is just how good does our model fit the data. But then we also have this either L0 or L1 loss that says how sparse is our model. So through the loss, we're balancing accuracy and complexity, which, again, complexity is a measure of how physical our model is. So in the kind of error versus complexity uh, plot, you know, if I have, if I crank this term, this, this, this hyperparameter lambda way, way up, then I'm going to promote overly sparse models, basically models that don't have the right dynamics. Those are going to be underfit. If I don't have enough lambda, if lambda is zero, and I don't have this regularizing term at all, I'm doing a simple least squares. I'm going to have models that are massively overfit. Those are the models with 81 terms in them. And then there's going to be some family of models you know, between these for different values of lambda. And so this loss function that we're, um, we're using to quantify the balance of error and complexity allows us to find a family of models, uh, some more complex, some less complex, some more accurate, some less accurate. And when you cross-validate uh, those models on a, on a withhold data set or on a, a test data set, you'll actually find that at some values of complexity, you start to overfit. If I start, if I 
don't penalize complexity enough, my models overfit. And there is a sweet spot where you get these parsimonious, these kind of Einstein, simplest models possible to describe the data, but no simpler. The sweet spot Goldilocks zone is right here, okay? Again, L2 norm to get your model error, L1 norm or L0 norm to promote sparsity, parsimony, to penalize complexity. Which, you know, again, open your physics textbook. We have been penalizing complexity for 2,000 years. A uh, lot of good references here. I have a whole video on this, um, a whole, like, actually five-hour video series on this that um, I'll point you to. Okay, good. Um, last thing before I end, again, um, loss functions, you know, everywhere, easy to, loss functions are, are how you shape your optimization landscape to train your model. It's, like, essential in machine learning. Equivariance, again, is um, there's this notion that symmetries are an important property of physics. Certain physics is rotationally invariant, some is translationally invariant. There's all of these symmetries and invariants in physics that we might want our models to adhere to. Um, here's just a cartoon of what I mean by equivariance. I'll have a whole, you know, we'll, we'll, you can click uh, through to find a video on equivariance later. But if you know that, for example, your system, so you have your model uh, f of x, inputs are x, outputs are y, and your neural network, for example, is this model f. If I know that my output should be the same if I flip x, if I have minus x, so I, let's say I have mirror symmetry, I can always add that into the loss function. So instead of augmenting my data and duplicating the size of my data, which is going to, you know, it's like, could be more expensive to train my neural network, I could just add another loss function, which says, you know, my model should be exactly the same if I flip x. If I mirror x, nothing should change. So this is kind of another way of augmenting your data, but virtually in your loss function. And I picked the simplest example of, you know, a mirror reflection symmetry, but you can also do this with rotations, translations, pretty much any, you know, Lie group or discrete symmetries. You can, in principle, you know, work through ways of building this into your loss function. Okay, so at a mile high, we were just talking about how this stage four of the machine learning process, crafting a loss function, gives lots of opportunities to embed physics. So you could add your physics, your, your partial differential equation, uh, like a physics-informed neural network. You could add L2 and L1 penalties in strategic places to make your models more low-dimensional or more sparse, which we know are going to be physical. And you can also bake in things like symmetries uh, and invariances and equivariances uh, into the loss function. Okay, uh, next we're going to talk about optimization. Again, intimately related because optimization is how we're going to tweak the parameters parameters of our architecture to minimize our loss function averaged over our data. So next we're going to talk about optimization. Uh, I'm looking forward to that one because that gives us really um, rigorous ways of enforcing physics almost exactly. Loss functions promote physics. They suggest physics. Uh, optimization, constrained optimization, is often a way of like enforcing that your physics is satisfied, that your symmetry or your conservation is satisfied. All right, that's all coming up. Thank you.